Hi, I'm Tracy Schumacher from the Democrat and Chronicle, and I'm here today with two winemakers, and we are talking ice wine. We have got Matt Kasava from Casa Larga Vineyards. Thanks Hi, for joining us. And we've got Mike Countryman from Point of the Bluff Vineyards. Hello. Hi. So I'm thinking you guys just probably went through some pretty cold harvests. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, we just harvested our Riesling ice wine on Wednesday of last week. Uh, down on Cuca Lake where we were, we had about 12 to 15 degrees for most of the day and, and heavy winds. So it was a cold day and uh, Matt is in a little different area so his temperatures may have varied a little bit. Yeah, we were about the same temperature wise, uh, less wind, which was nice. <laughs> Very nice, yeah. I'll bet. So let's, before we get real deep into the harvest and all this other kind of stuff, do you, why don't you kick us off with just exactly what is ice wine for anyone that doesn't know? Uh, the basic process of ice wine is um, frozen grapes to, to the literal sense. Uh, we, we net our grapes in the fall to keep the deer and the birds from, from eating them and then they hang on the vine until we get cold enough weather where the actual berries freeze. Uh, the water is frozen in the grape so that when we press that all you get is basically the sugars and the acids out of it uh, in a concentrated form. So that can be in December, it can be in January, depending on Mother Nature. And so it ends up as a dessert wine with Correct. the tall bottles, and it's more expensive than regular wine. I mean, even, even a small bottle of ice wine runs more than a lot of regular still wines. Absolutely, and uh, the price reflects part of what Mike was talking about. Um, the press separates liquids from solids. And if the water that would otherwise be part of the fruit juice is frozen into an ice cube, it gets left behind with the solids. So we're getting way, way less juice yield out of a ton of grapes. Um, there's also the risk of when you leave grapes outside through the fall into the winter, uh, we do put nets around the grapes to try to protect them, but there's still deer, there's still birds, they're hungry, there's nothing else to eat, there's snow on the ground and a, a big purple berry or a big you know golden berry hanging there looks like a meal and they'll they'll figure out a way to eat them so we lose a little bit of fruit um, so we're able to produce these pretty much in pretty small quantities um, which kind of makes them rare uh, they're also extra super delicious so um, it costs a little <laughs> bit more money and I well, like to oh I'm sorry oh no I like to use the term instead of expensive valuable because yeah. of Matt he had perfectly described it there's a lot of value in that, and we're one of the only regions in the world that can do high quality ice wines. If you look at, you need a warm enough summer to grow the grapes, but a cold enough winter to freeze them. So there's not many regions that can actually do that in the quantities that we do. So there's a huge value in that, and the word valuables, I like to use more than expensive in that respect. Well, Matt, you know that I, I came out to a particularly frigid ice wine harvest one year, and uh, was, I mean, blown away in a couple sense of the, the words, but um, it has to be, it's, this isn't just 32 degrees. You guys have to get below 15, is that correct? Yeah, so we try to use um, negative eight Celsius as the standard, which is lower like between 17 and 18. But um, yeah, it's a little bit different every year. Uh, we'll often, because there's so much risk in letting the grapes hang, um, the longer you let them hang, the more kind of crop loss you're gonna you're going to incur. So we usually try to get the grapes in on the first window where it's below that negative eight Celsius. Um, and sometimes that means it's 10 degrees and sometimes it means it's 15. And uh, the year you were there, I think it was a lot less than either of those. It was, it was horrendous. That's why you're here <laughs> instead well, of me that's, going that's out the to the vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> and you love it. I mean, do you both revel in this kind of crazy frozen tundra process? I, I do enjoy it. I don't mind the out the cold, the outdoors. Um, I do look forward to the ice wine, and I don't do it every year, uh, only because I have some parameters that I like to use, but um, you know, the years I do it, I, it's, it's kind of a, a flagship for us, or a, you know, it's something that is just once in a great while, so I look forward to doing that. So what are those parameters? I mean, are you, are you deciding based on the grapes you have? Yeah, um, we're a little bit smaller than Casa Larga, but what I like to do, uh, there's a, you know, our vineyards are smaller and there's a lot of stress on the vine to leave the grapes hang. So I do rotate which vines I use every year or alternate years. Um, the fall, the weather going into the fall, how the grapes are holding up. Uh, we make an ice, a Riesling ice wine, which Riesling tends to rot in the uh, wet weather in the fall so you have to make sure they're in prime condition going into that 
And then just the, the basic growing season, how the grapes taste. And, and so I make that decision usually about October and say we're going to leave some for ice wine or not. Uh, so I've skipped a couple years now and we're on to the 2017 uh, just based on how I felt about the Riesling. So. Okay, and just if you're just joining us, we are talking ice wine with two winemakers from the general Finger Lakes region and they just have had their harvest and we're kind of talking about ice wine and how it's made and what it is. Um, so uh, Matt, do you use different kinds of wine for ice wine or do you always use the same, I'm sorry, I'm not saying this very well, the, the, the grapes. The, <laughs> do, okay. So we, we have a flagship, it's Vidal Blanc. Um, Mike was, Mike was saying earlier, uh, one of the main things when you're trying to, to select grapes for ice wine is they have to be really, really healthy going into that extended season. So when it's fall time and it's time to harvest grape fruit for your regular uh, wine crops, you know, we'll try to pick something out that is pristinely healthy. Because if it's not healthy going into the extended hang time, it's not gonna be healthy coming out and it's not gonna make a great, a great ice wine. Um, one of the reasons why we select Vidal is the one that we work with every single year is just that it's really, really well suited for the ice wine process. It's basically it's tough. Um, it's got really, really thick skins, um, which allows it to endure more like freeze thaw cycles, you know, the windy conditions, just the extra moisture that gets on the grapes um, as they're hanging there through the fall into the winter. Um, so it tends to hold up a little bit better going into the cold season. It also has really, really nice natural acidity. So these, these wines are gonna end up being really, really sweet. Sometimes 10 times as sweet as a normal table wine. Um, and in order for that to come off as a balanced, enjoyable wine, you need a little bit of acid to kind of balance it out so it doesn't come off as being really, really cloying. And Vidal has that, even if you let it hang way, way into the year, it has like that really nice tart finish to kind of clean off your palate after you taste the wine. Um, Mike said he was making out of Riesling. Riesling offers the same benefit. It has, it has a ton of acidity, um, really, really nice kind of tropical flavors if you let it hang for a long time, just like Vidal. Um, we also will work with Riesling, but only in years where I'm really, really confident that it's going to be able to hang that extra amount of time. Um, it is a little bit more sensitive to, to some of the extra conditions that you'd have to expose it to for ice wine. So we don't work with that every year, um, but we have in the past. We've also tried Gewürztraminer a couple of times and Cab Franc as well. Um, tends to work pretty well. Great. And none of these wines, some people when they think of dessert wines in other regions, think of Rieslings that have botrytis, they've mm -hmm. been, uh, had the noble rot. Is, is that a totally different ball game? Or, yeah. or you don't make an ice wine from a, a grape that has had, that has botrytis? No, and actually to follow up on that, what Matt said and we were talking about earlier, it's a totally different product. Okay. Uh, you prefer that it doesn't have the botrytis. Uh, by the time, if it is infected with it, there'll be nothing left of the grapes when it comes harvest time. So again, they have to be pristine and clean going into the fall. And that's why with only making Riesling at this point, I don't do it every year. That's one of the reasons. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, makes sense. I so a little bit of botrytis in the Riesling can work. Um, a little bit. Some of that, like, it's really hard to not pick up a little bit of that as you're hanging into you know, late November, early December, sometimes January. You're going to get a little bit, bit of botrytis, but that tends to add to the complexity of the ice wine, I think. Sure. Um, but it doesn't come off you know, totally like a German TBA or anything like that, where like honey is the first thing you get on the palate. You get a lot of Riesling and a little bit of botrytis character kind of in the background, which works really nicely, I think, in Riesling ice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any years where you don't I mean, have, have you, either one of you had years where you've left wines for um, ice wine and have not been able to get a harvest at all? Does it ever happen? Yeah, it, it does. Um, I've actually been doing ice wine since 1994, so I have a few years. Uh, basically, at some point, you have to make a decision on what you want to do with that uh, because you can still harvest it not frozen and make different products from that. A oh, late okay. harvest, uh, still a dessert wine, but you, it won't be an ice wine. So I have had a, a few years in that time frame that, that we weren't able, it never got cold enough um, to make a true ice wine. And, and is every wine labeled ice wine made with this process where they wait for the 15 degrees, they leave it on the, the, the vines? Is every ice wine made that way? 
Because I because I do understand that there are some wineries that don't go through this process and they make a dessert wine by freezing their grapes, right? Sure. So Correct. The the labeling requirements are rather specific. Um, so if you see the grape variety followed by the exact word ice wine, um, that is indicative that it was made in the traditional fashion. Um, they also make you include other information such as the residual sugar, um, the amount of sugar that was in the grapes at harvest is required to be on there. So all of those little technical terms are indications that it's an actual ice wine. Um, sometimes you'll see things that say like the word ice without the word wine, which okay. um, so that's clue indicates number one. that it probably was not um, made in the traditional method. Correct. So it might say ice, it might say late harvest or something. Right, well the, ter the term iced with a D on is kind of uh, become a uh, I'll call it a loophole on that. Uh, your, your average consumer doesn't realize sometimes the difference between an ice wine and an iced wine. Um, the traditional method is very hard, very time consuming. There's a lot of labor and labor of love that goes into it. Um, so to cryogenically freeze them uh, at harvest time or shortly after and come out with the product, it is a little bit of a shortcut and you know it's less expensive and you know, you'll, so you'll see some of those bottles at the 375 for half the cost that you would an ice wine. Uh, so as a consumer, you got to kind of watch what the label says. Realize that sometimes you get what you pay for uh, when you buy a bottle and, you know, you're paying a little bit more for the ice wine because of the technique and, and the quality behind it. And how do you guys like to, to drink ice wine? Is it just something you have on your own or do, do you pair it with anything? Uh, it's obviously not something you're going to just drink, drink with dinner. Um, so, why don't you let uh, it know? You I, I'll go first and then you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, we, we do uh, Riesling uh, either on its own right after dinner, just a very small amount, uh, nice after dinner, but I love to pair it with uh, very sharp cheeses, uh, some really aged cheddars. Uh, I think it, that salt sweet goes great. And then you can go the other extreme. Uh, we, we've done creme brulee with that Riesling, and it's phenomenal. So You're, Like you've eaten creme brulee with, with, with Riesling? With the Riesling oh, in, a, okay. in a small glass. And, and I always say, you know, a bottle like that, you know, we can, for dessert, you know, six, eight, ten people, uh, a bottle's plenty, and you just a little bit for a dessert. But but the pairing is, is definitely the way to go, in my opinion. I love, love Pair it with something else. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think Mike hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, we have a, I have a bunch of ice wine in my home cellar, and we really only open them when, they're, when there's company over. Mm -hmm. it's, no, it's a great thing to bring out when you have friends around the table. Um, yeah, I would usually stick with dessert pairings. Uh, cheese does work fantastic. Something, something mild at dessert, like an angel food cake, something that's not gonna really compete with a wine, I think works great. Um, on the other hand, we do have, we have an ice wine festival at Casa Larga every year, and uh, our, our caterer works ice wine into every, every dish um, as an ingredient. So they've done things from make marshmallows with it to make barbecue sauce with it. I made it. I made a vinaigrette with ice wine. Yeah, it works and it great. Was really nice. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of uh, sacrilegious in a way to take something and throw it in with agree. all that other stuff. I mean, it really it was bad in a way. But I mean, just in, in retrospect. But it, I had it, and that's what I did. With yeah, that. I mean, I've seen it mixed with sparkling wine, champagnes, uh -huh. uh, different drinks, uh, ice wine drinks, and and again, I go back to. Uh, because we make it and put so much into it, the pure form of it to me is is the way to have it. All the other products are great, and, and you know I would enjoy them, but I hate to see it put in with something else sometimes like that. It's pretty good over ice cream. Though. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Pretty good over <laughs> ice cream, like vanilla ice cream. Oh yeah. yeah. Sounds good. You mentioned you have ice wine in your cellar. Does it age well? It absolutely does. Mm -hmm. um, the acidity, the high sugar, uh, lends it to aging really well. It kind of it changes as it ages. Um, tends to take on kind of like a caramely butterscotchy flavor, oh, I think. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. I'll give you a quick story and, and something. Uh, I actually opened a bottle of uh, 1995 uh, ice wine uh, probably this past summer. It happened to be one I make um, for Kesselarga at the time. <laughs> um, phenomenal. Yeah, 1995, uh, let's see, so that's uh, 22 years old. Yeah. Um, it did change very, very... Uh, coffee, mocha, as it aged, it, it, but it was just, and it was a vanilla ice wine. Uh, very butterscotch in there, uh, great though, but aging is definitely uh, a choice. Awesome. Um, and once you open them, how long, are they, do they just keep a few days like, like regular wine? At my house, or? <laughs> well, <laughs> theoretically, should you open them and not consume the whole bottle at once, is, is what is the, um, 
It's just a few days, not even. I, I think it'll keep in your cellar or in your refrigerator for a couple of days. I would okay. it, once you open it though, and you're you're gonna save it for the next day. I would try to put it in the refrigerator. Um, it's always nice to try to transfer it to like a smaller container if you have one. If you have one of those vacuum saver things, it'll help a little bit, but it'll stay drinking well a little bit longer than a regular table wine is. But that being said, um, once you pop a bottle of wine, usually you want to get you want to get to drinking it um, sooner than later. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> okay. Well, and you know, if it if if you go too long, you can always make a vinaigrette. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, anything else you want us to know about ice wine? I think we've covered the bases mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we, we've. Great. Yeah, and the Ice Wine Festival, do you, it's February? Yes, we always uh, throw it right around Valentine's Day. I think it's the weekend before this year. Great. Um, at the winery. Uh, so we invite every producer of natural ice wines in the state. Um, so there'll be other wineries there as well as uh, we'll be pouring Castle Largo wines. Um, there's seminars, there's sleigh rides through the vineyard. Um, yeah, there's always all sorts of fun events going on. So it's it's a uh, you can hop on our website castellarga.com and check it out. Great. And anything you want to promote from? Well, I think Point ice wine um, makes a great Christmas gift, uh, only because it's it is a little more valuable. Um, it's something uh, packaged really nice. Uh, it's very limited for people, so I would say. As a gift, people would love to have that. So yeah, that would be a nice gift. Especially push that for a Christmas present. And, uh, yeah. Well, especially knowing that people can age it, so you don't have to right. have it right away or drink yep. it while it's fresh. So, Okay, well, thank you for joining me. Well, thank yeah, you. This was a really good chat, chat, and I'm glad we did it in a warm place instead of a yeah. cold place. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks. thank you. Thanks for joining us.